Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this Regime to Decom video, we're going to be discussing and analyzing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. There has been a very interesting image that has surfaced on Reddit, which hints to NVIDIA prototyping a new GeForce graphics card, most likely the GV102, possibly. Anyway, at this point, it's almost certain that we're going to be seeing the new architecture known as Turing. Now, the good bet is that Turing and Volta are very similar to one another. Just to quickly go through what I mean by that, it's most likely that the difference between Volta and Turing, one, is that we see the replacement of HBM2 with GDDR6, we'll get to the specifications of the supposed prototype board in just a second, as well as some key architectural differences, which most likely will reduce the performance of deep learning and other such um, abilities of the graphics card, which of course would make it more in line with what you would expect for a consumer level product. So there are 12 distinctive GDDR6 modules on this particular prototype board. This tells us that we're looking at 384-bit interface. Now if you actually look very closely at the chips, we can see that they are indeed made by Micron, and the reason that this is critical is a couple of things. One, we know from a press statement that we are looking at most likely 8 GB modules, which means we have 12 gigabytes total memory on the board, but also that we can see that they are indeed 14 GBPS in speed. So how much memory bandwidth does this provide? Well, you're looking at around 200 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth faster than the previous generation. With the bus width and the memory clocks, we're looking at around 672 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth, which is absolutely insane. There are also three 8-pin power connectors on this board, which places the TDP around 525 watts. Now, before everyone starts panicking, most likely this is because it is a prototype board. In fact, we can see various uh, switches and other bits and pieces around, which obviously, once again, will not be present in the retail sample. And just if you need further clarification of that, the actual GPU itself, which of course is kind of important to make the graphics card work, is also missing in this particular photo. I can't hazard a guess of the power consumption of this particular board because it's such an early engineering prototype stage. And even if we could, it would just be me pulling a figure out my butt. But however, I can almost guarantee it's not going to be anywhere near this power hungry. Most likely what they're doing at the moment, the reason it's way over 500 watts, is just so that they can figure out what clock speeds they can actually really hit with this particular architecture. Don't forget one of the earlier rumors was that NVIDIA were playing around with ways of improving the clock speed further. Um, and obviously it's a bit of an ambiguous statement, but the rumor was that NVIDIA would allow the GPU to run at higher clock speeds. And obviously Pascal can already go way north of two gigahertz. So in theory, at least, we could be seeing it even higher. So most likely at this point, NVIDIA don't want power consumption to be the limiting factor. Instead, they probably are trying to figure out exactly what the GPU itself is capable of by just giving it as much juice as it can and then letting heat and nature, such as yields and that type of thing, actually tell them what clock speeds they can realistically hit. And then, of course, they can start dialing that in with the BIOS and telling AIBs. We can also see what looks like to be some type of NVLink connector at the top there, which is kind of curious for a couple of reasons. One, board partners as well as NVIDIA themselves have been less pushy of SLI technologies. And two, you would assume NVLink would be kind of pricey to add into this. Now, it is possible we're seeing a couple of things here. One, NVIDIA have found a way to make SLI a lot easier to implement and therefore it requires a different connector. In other words, you can almost think of it as like SLI 2.0 or whatever you want to call it. Or the second possibility is that it's just there because it's a prototype board and they're just playing around with things. It's possible hell, it's not even connected to anything really and it's not doing anything in the actual final retail silicon. They just used it because they're reusing a PCB from another particular uh, GPU. Now, I did try to get some estimates on the actual size of the GPU itself, but of course it's incredibly hard because the GPU does not exist in this particular image. I did the obvious thing, and that's to look at the size of the GDDR6 memory modules and then kind of do a quick measurement, but 
it's eyeball only, but it looks like possibly we're looking at a GPU that's around 6700 square um, mm square. Let's go on the lower end of the estimate and say it's 600 uh, mm squared. Well, if you compare that to 470 mm squared of the GTX 1080 Ti, and you can see that there is still a massive discrepancy there, which does make me somewhat reluctant to be 100% certain that it is in fact the successor to the current GeForce lineup. It is possible that we are not looking at that. Another possibility is that this GPU is going to be absolutely gargantuan in size, but will be a replacement instead for the very high end. So I guess you could assume it'd be something like the 1180 Ti. The Titan V is around 800 square mm just for sake of comparison. So it's not like it's so gargantuan, it's out of the realms of possibility, but it is just worthy of note that it is possible that if this is indeed a GeForce card, we are looking at a GPU with an immense number of CUDA cores available to it and possibly some other tweaks as well, like perhaps larger caches and other bits and pieces that of course we can't really predict. For example, does it have tensor cores? So what's my thought on this? Well, most likely we are almost certainly not looking at the 1180. What we are instead looking at right here is a card which is going to be the highest end consumer SKU available, assuming it is, once again, a GeForce card. But if it is a consumer SKU, which is like the 1180 or the 1180 Ti, this card is going to be monstrous. It is going to absolutely decimate the current Pascal generation, most likely, just given the sheer estimate of size of the die for A and B, and B, the sheer amount of memory bandwidth available to the GPU, which is obviously kind of a difficult indicator of performance. After all, if you have better memory compression technologies, then at the end of the day, bandwidth becomes a more relative figure based upon the actual architecture itself. But still, it does tell us that the sheer amount of data that's going to be pushed is going to be incredible. And the fact that they are packing 12 gigabytes of memory on this thing, assuming that's the amount that we see in retail samples, and we can probably guess it might be because of the bus width, well, <laughs> That tells us that this GPU is designed for high resolution textures. It's designed for workloads which would contain massive amounts of data. In other words, we're looking at most likely a GPU which would be quite comfortable at pumping games out at 4K. And I, for one, will be very curious to see what this actual GPU, once again, assuming it is a consumer level card, would be capable of running the likes of modern day games, for example, Rise of the Tomb Raider or whatever else, plus, of course, future games. And it's going to be very curious. Well, if I didn't talk about this news story, um, I would get bombarded by it in the comments. So this actually popped up literally an hour or so after we'd wrapped up yesterday, after we'd finished filming and editing. Um, and that is, of course, the story of NVIDIA's leaked NDA, non-disclosure agreement. Now, I want to make two disclaimers before uh, we continue the video. The first is that I am not an expert in the legal field. Therefore, you can take what what I say on this matter with some level of like, well, maybe, um, you know, I'm more speaking about it from the perspective of a reviewer and someone who has done some like kind of due diligence on this from perspective of other reviewers for A and B, I want to also make it clear that I have not signed this NDA, NVIDIA have not sent me this NDA. I do not work currently with NVIDIA directly. I will say so that I have had a couple of interviews with NVIDIA and we have received uh, review samples, but that's for other part uh, parties, excuse me, like Zotac, like MSI or whomever else. And they've sent us, let's say, the GTX 1080 or the 1080 Ti or the 1060 or whatever other card. So whether it's Galax, MSI, Zotac, whatever, they're the ones that sent us the card. We've not worked directly with NVIDIA. Therefore, all opinions on this are our own. And that's just kind of like, I feel it's at least worth having that preface there in case you're a new viewer and you've stumbled on this video. because so I just want to make it abundantly clear. Now, let's begin. So the website heist.de uh, decided to not sign a NDA, which was provided to them by NVIDIA. And instead they have decided to publish the NDA online and put out an article which, uh, pretty much says and alleges that NVIDIA are being very unethical with its practices. Now, do bear in mind that after the whole GPP thing, people are 
it's ready to just jump down NVIDIA's throats, right? It's pretty standard. And there are certainly some vague terms in the NDA, which if you read them in isolation, can seem to be kind of bad. But look, in my personal opinion, I do feel that this is being somewhat overblown. There are other reviewers as well who have uh, said very similar things. Now, I have signed NDAs in the past, and NDAs are pretty standard as a reviewer. I'm not going to go through all of the NDAs I've signed, but I have signed them with uh, MSI before launch pro uh, products. I've signed them with uh, AMD. We've signed them with multiple people. Uh, whether it's a sponsored deal, whether it's just a review, whether it's an interview, uh, even actually, uh, this is me being totally honest with you, I even had to agree to an NDA with the Kronos group before the Vulcan, um, what was it? The Vul yeah, yeah, it was, it was definitely the Vulcan API before the uh, updated specifications of the Vulcan API. I had to, we had the interview prior to the release and I got the interview up for the release of the Vulcan API, but I could not disclose information prior to that. And we were, you know, essentially said that we can't talk about it, we can't do this, we can't do that. But of course, it's the verbiage here which people are concerned about. Computerbase.de actually have a really good write-up on this very subject, so I'll remember to link it in the video description. And their opinions are actually closely aligned with my own. So the basic gist here is that it's very standard legalese. It's very standard to be given this information because they don't want you as a reviewer to be given privileged information and then to leak that privileged information prior either to the launch of a graphics card or um, to be told something in privilege and then reveal that and put that out as a news story. So I'm giving an example here but let's say that I was told something like, well, the reason that the GeForce GTX 11 series was postponed is because NVIDIA felt that, um, I don't know, that they screwed up the design and there was a major flaw in it. And it was, they also didn't feel pressured because AMD weren't putting out new graphics cards. And then I attributed that as a conversation I had with NVIDIA's, you know, Bob, in the technical marketing department, then obviously that would be kind of a bad look for NVIDIA. And obviously, you know, I would be taking advantage of privileged information that I was given. With that said, if I learned that information through a different source, so for example, there's an IIB that told me that at a particular event, and I can attribute that to, an, to a conversation I had from an AIB, then that would not be something that I would get in trouble for. Other websites such as Guru3D have also echoed these statements and honestly the press, uh, members of the press are regularly given NDAs. Now here's the thing, uh, if you believe that there is something cagey going on, no matter what I say or what any other reviewer says, you're probably going to believe that something cagey is going on. But honestly, um, if you're given a um, NDA, that you sign, you can still pretty much say whatever you want. In fact, even with a couple of sponsored deals, I've actually been uh, somewhat critical of them in some instances because they had like, older generation uh, processes in or whatever. And I did say that at the time and that was fine. There was no issues there, but for review, I've had no issues with any NDA thing. And from what I can tell with the verbiage that's in this documentation, it's very similar to other review embargo stuff that I've had to sign in the past. My personal opinion about this, and I'm, once again, I'm not a lawyer, is that this is very similar to what we've seen uh, before time and time again as reviewers. You're given an NDA, uh, the verbiage is very similar, and it is a little bit ambiguous, but with, of course, once again, with GPP, people are super vigilant right now, which is a good thing. I'm not criticizing folks for actually looking at this and thinking, Okay, is that something that we need to take into consideration? Does that mean that NVIDIA are trying to control the price? Because it's good to be mindful of this, and I'm not coming across as like us and them. Um, I am a reviewer, but A, I don't get that much stuff from NVIDIA. In fact, as I said, I get no products from NVIDIA, but we do get press statements and other bits and pieces from them for A, and B, I'm also a gamer, I'm also an enthusiast, and I also buy a lot of the stuff we've got. Like, I own a GTX 1080, but I bought that GTX 1080 with 
my own money. I wasn't given a GTX 1080. I would love to have been given a GTX 1080, but we're not big enough really for that to happen. Um, so we just weren't given a GTX 1080. And I'm just speaking honestly and plainly here. That's just how it is. Um, and you know, as we get bigger, perhaps we'll get more opportunities for this. Now, some folks are going to say, well, all tech reviewers should just buy their own hardware. First of all, it's just not going to happen unless you're ridiculously successful and very, very large as a company, uh, sorry, as a reviewer. The costs of actually doing that are rather prohibitive uh, because just for example, if you're like a, a small to medium YouTuber or a website, just think of the cost of buying like a 1080 and a 1070, which both were uh, products at launch. And then of course, that's just the Founders Edition card. So then you've got to worry about if you were to say want to review AIB variants of the card. And then you've got the 1060s, you've got the 1060 3 gigabyte model and the 6 gigabyte model. It becomes extremely expensive. Even if you start to flip them on eBay, it's just A, a lot of work and B, you're going to be kind of late to the party as well for the review, which is also another thing you need to take into consideration. So, you know, at the end of the day, being given stuff like even games, we've been given games before for the purposes of review, and we've always said, well, we don't like them, or we dislike them, or we love them, or we hate them. It's just kind of how it is for reviewers, because imagine if you're primarily a game reviewer, and I don't really consider this channel that much of a game review channel, but imagine if you were a games review channel or a games review website, and you had to keep plonking down that cash, particularly if you're a smaller one, it's kind of expensive. So what's my overall thoughts and opinions on this? Well, I think it's kind of business as usual. I do think the verbiage taken out of context is not ideal. Um, and so I think that there needs to be a little bit of additional clarity maybe on the NDA, but obviously this NDA is missing the context of follow-up conversations with the PR representative that you've been speaking with. Now, once again, I can only come at this from my perspective with the companies that I have dealt with, but there have been a couple of instances in the past with NDAs or what have you, where I'm like, uh, could you clarify what this means? As in the context of what I am doing right now, could you clarify how this impacts me? Does that mean I can't say this? Or, no, no, but I, no, here's what it means, X, Y, and Z. And then you've got that in a written email to say, okay, here's what it means, here's what that means. And obviously we don't have that particular context here. And you have to remember from it as a review point, from a reviewer's point of view. But that, with that said, don't, let stuff like this slide in the past and uh, sorry in the future and by which i mean don't just be like oh okay this is fine do question it it's good to question it but don't just believe it as well like be skeptical but mindful that's my personal opinion and you can take that one way or another and once again you know that's just my opinion and i'm not a legal expert with all of that said, hopefully you have enjoyed the video. Um, normal stuff, like, share, comment, and subscribe uh, if you so desire. Um, yeah, with all of that. Anyway, with all of that said, thanks very much for watching the video. Normal stuff, like, share, comment, and subscribe. I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.